I work at Automatic. My name is Jesse Friedman. I work in uh, marketing and strategic partnerships on the Jetpack team at Automatic. I threw this page up there because uh, all too often I find that people, uh, really talented people, experienced people, sometimes are a little hesitant to jump in and apply at Automatic. Uh, but we don't bite and we're eager to meet you. So if you have any questions about uh, the hiring process or if I know you well enough that I can give you a recommendation, please don't hesitate to ask uh, and, and join us. We have a lot of fun. Uh, you can find me on Twitter. My handle is at Professor. That's because I used to teach. Um, and I joined Twitter on like day two. <laughs> I also have a pretty cool blog URL because I work at Automatic. We all got lucky and we got to choose uh, a dot blog domain. So if you want to check out my site or connect with me afterwards, that's a good place to do that too. Uh, but today we're here to talk about personalization. And this is a topic that I've talked on a few times. But something I've never really done uh, is kind of go back and give you guys a high level overview uh, and inspire you to figure out ways in which you can start to approach these things on your website. So in the past, I gave a lot of uh, concrete, uh, like specific things that you should be doing uh, to try and reach out to customers. But today, what we're going to do is have a, a more of a high-level discussion uh, about ways in which you can start to understand the intent of your customers. And however you want to pers uh, define personalization, what we're basically doing is changing or augmenting the website uh, for the purposes of a specific user or group of users uh, to change and improve their experience. The idea here is to provide the absolute best experience possible. Uh, and sometimes it's to speed up the process, sometimes it's to slow it down. Uh, but at the end of the day, at the core of it, what we're doing is basically changing things. Uh, a good friend of mine uh, is giving a talk later today, Tom Shapiro. He's giving a much more practical kind of um, granular talk on how to use Google Analytics and other tools to really track specific uh, actions that are happening on your website. So I would definitely encourage you to take everything you learned today and go learn how to apply it to Tom. I love that Tom talks after me at these work camps because I get to unload all the stuff I don't cover on him. Um, so one thing I want to point out to everybody is that personalization isn't one thing. And I think that a lot of times we think it is, but it's not convenience. Everybody wants a convenient and, and good experience, uh, unless you're this person. And now, I've given uh, talks a few times, and I've been uh, using an a, a image from someone who brought in uh, like a large computer into a Starbucks. And yesterday, I was at a Starbucks in Boston, and this woman had a giant iMac computer in the Starbucks. And I was thinking about this talk, and the thing that made me think of like, everybody wants a convenient experience, uh, except for this person who I feel like walked into an Apple store and said, screw it, I don't want a small 13-inch display that I can put into my laptop bag. I want a 27-inch iMac that weighs 42 pounds, and I'm going to bring that to a Starbucks. And just to prove that I was there, I had to take a second. <laughs> um, but really, when we think about convenience, uh, if you, anybody ever order a pizza off a Domino's app or anything like that, and it shows you your previous order, that's a matter of convenience. That's not really uh, innovative or personal. Uh, that's showing you what you ordered last and giving you a very convenient click here to reorder button. Uh, that's very different than what we're talking about today, which is customizing an experience through predictive analytics and, and the actions that we want to uh, track and, and watch these users and what they're doing. Uh, everybody thinks that the people out there who are doing it, uh, who can only do it, are the big names, Netflix, Amazon, and Google. Um, and speaking of convenience for what isn't personalization, good design isn't personalization. Good design is just something you should do. And right now, these logos look like they're tattooed on Kermit's butt. Uh, but switching to a better design, that's not personalization. That's just something that you should be doing all the time. Also, did it just say Kermit's butt? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> just want to make sure that that's on there. Um, <laughs> Kermit's my hair right now. It's great. Uh, and you might think that you have to work this hard all the time to get personalization going, uh, but that's not the case. Last year, I, I uh, played around with the sonography, too. 
I uh, baited them into writing things that you know, otherwise wouldn't look. Anyways, so to jump in, uh, there's three things that really you want to start doing when you're just starting out with personalization. Uh, one is you want to start to identify who is visiting your website. The second most important thing to figure out is what is their intent. And the assumption that you have a blog post on X topic uh, and they're reading it does not mean that they came there to read that, that, that uh, blog post. Um, or if they're visiting your e-commerce site and they're looking at different products, the intent doesn't necessarily mean that they're there to purchase that product. Uh, and a lot of times we see this mistake with uh, people purchasing products for families or friends. You make the assumption that this user will be forever tied to a product. Like if I were to purchase my wife a pair of lacy white sandals or something, um, I don't even know if that's a thing, but I'll just assume it is. Uh, I don't want to forever be tied to white sandals, uh, women's white sandals on whatever website I'm on. Uh, so try not to make these assumptions and try to understand the intent of the user. And then the third thing you want to understand is how can you convert that intent into uh, something valuable for you as the site owner, the developer, the design agency, whatever. So we're going to take a look at four different types of sites today. We're going to take a look at a blog, a restaurant website, an e-commerce website, and a SaaS service website. Um, now, in the past when I've given these talks, what we've talked about is how quickly and easily you can start to discover things about the user. And uh, you know what we think of as a user is this amorphous blog of it could be anybody. Uh, we have no idea how they self-identify, who they are, where they are, um, and you know we start to dig into personalization and we dig up something like this, and we assign them an ID. We understand what browser they're using, what device they're on, and what their location is, but that's not really painting the full picture. But those are really important pieces of the puzzle, so we can start there and start to build a relationship with our users uh, from there on out. So the first few things that are very easy to discover through just technological advances in HTML5 and browsers and everything else is just around location, the device, the return, whether they're a returning user, this is cookies, or if you're lucky enough to run a website where you can get people to log in, that's my favorite because then you're not just relying on a cookie to save this information about this user, but you can actually store this information on the website, in your database, securely, of course, uh, and then make decisions every time that person returns to your site. So, diving in, first thing we're going to look at is the blog. What are the goals of the blog? Well, in this case, uh, we want people to subscribe, and we want people to comment. Uh, we might want them to share, and maybe stay a little bit longer than they otherwise would. So, today, uh, I'm picking on my wife, who's sitting right here. She made the mistake of showing up today um, to support me, and of course, you know, payback is, is always there. But this is her blog. Um, I think it's a, a really great blog. It's on a few different topics, so it's a good example for us to, uh, to pick on. Uh, so when we think about the goals, uh, we want people to subscribe. Joy has um, the Jetpack subscribe button on the, on the widget on the sidebar of the site. Uh, she has a form for you to fill out a comment, so the tools are there. Uh, she also has Jetpack sharing buttons. You guys can tell them shamelessly uh, promoting our product. And they also have uh, related posts, which are a really nice, um, uh, subtle way to increase engagement. In fact, uh, when we uh, helped a newspaper uh, install uh, Jetpack and turn on related posts, it was the Albuquerque Journal. Uh, it was a newspaper that gets like 500,000 visitors a month or, or a day, I can't remember. It was significant. Uh, we increased engagement by 4% overnight just by them turning on related posts. But the more significant thing was is that we actually reduced their infrastructure costs because Jetpack handles all of the related post algorithms on the WordPress.com servers. So you don't have to actually put that onto your host or your servers. Uh, all right, so we also have uh, tags. Um, but unfortunately, Joy isn't taking advantage of categories, and we're going to talk about that in a little bit. I told you we wouldn't get out of this group. Um, all right, so the first thing we want to do is start listening to the user. Let's take a, uh, an example. I'm a user, and I arrive at Joy's website on this post, uh, which is about um, why it's important to wear uh, bracelets if you have an allergy, so that, uh, like a medical bracelet. 
Um, so we know what posts or pages this person's visited. Um, did they scroll all the way down? This is a great question to ask, and not a lot of people think about it, because it allows us to um, start doing things like marking the post red. So if you want to in the future, you can uh, organize posts by either red or unread for the user. Uh, and it also kind of speaks to whether or not the user was on there long enough to read the post, uh, which is the next point. Um, did they do a search? After they read that, did they do a search? Did they click on a related post? Did they stick around? Search is super important, and I'll get to that. Uh, did they click any links or categories or tags? And the funny thing about categories and tags is that everybody thinks that it's built in uh, to your posts for um, Google and for uh, organizing things and keeping things uh, you know, really on point and focused. But there's so many advantages to categories and tags, and we don't take advantage of them. Uh, and did they share? And for whatever reason, did they comment and uh, animate it? So. Uh, so the first step, what if uh, just we want to make this a little bit more personal for the user, we take that subscribe button that just says something very plain and simple, uh, and we change it to a related to the category that this post is in. So this post could be in an allergy-related category, and this would be one of the simplest things you can do to change and start personalizing your site would be to just grab the category name for the post that it's in and just sub it into anywhere that that person lands. So that's a very, very basic, simple example. Um, and I talked about categories. Unfortunately, this post is uncategorized. But if it did have a category, there would be uh, a lot of stuff that we can do. It's free data. If anybody clicks on a category, um, works through a post, or visits multiple posts in the same category, you can immediately start to profile that user as someone who's interested in that category. So making sure that your posts have categories is really important, not just for link structure or for Google, but for you to be able to understand the path the user's taking. Um, did everybody in here know that every single category and every single tag right now on your WordPress website has its own RSS feed? If you go to any tag or any category on WordPress and you just do slash feed at the end, it'll automatically convert to RSS. This means that you can automatically give your users the opportunity to subscribe to very specific feeds within your site. This is no extra work. You don't have to do anything at all. Anytime that you have a category or a tag uh, listed, you can have a subscribe button that just goes to whatever URL you're on now, slash feed, and then that person can choose to subscribe. Um, all right, so next thing, commenting. We want people to comment. Uh, but one way in which we can improve the experience is that once they comment, uh, we have them check the, like a pre box, uh, a box pre check to say that we're going to get in contact with you. Uh, commenting is one of the most underutilized things, I think, in all of WordPress. I mean, at this point, this person has given you their, their name, their email address, their website URL, and have made some kind of comment on your website, whether it be positive or negative. Uh, so if you're a serious blogger and you're not reaching out to these people uh, and talking to people who comment on your site, uh, you're missing out. There's definitely also other tools out there that you can go look at, like um, auto-following people. So if they have a website and uh, they have Facebook and Twitter on their website, you can auto-follow them and things like that. So you can really reach out to these people on a more personal level. Um, but one thing I think that's really important is to think about is like an email follow-up with any commenters. Uh, so if you use something like a kismet to block out all the spam, shameless plug again, uh, then you can start to look at these comments that are good and start reaching out to them. And you can do this in an automated way if you want. Um, the thing I'd like to do is remind them that they shared their info with you. So don't come off like super creepy and have them like email them a week later and be like, hey, you were on my site. What's up? You know, that's, that's not cool. But if you tell them, remind them of the comment that they left and thank them for, uh, for doing it and tell them how appreciative you are that they left that comment, um, and then you recap their visit, this is something that a lot of people don't do either. But the second that they tied all of their visit and uh, the time that they spent on your website to a form submission, that's data that you can then take and give back to them. So for example, if I visit your blog and I go to uh, the Allermates post that Joy wrote, and then I go click on another post and maybe another post, then I leave a comment, 
There's no reason that I couldn't grab those URLs that you visited and summarize them and send them back to you and say, hey, thanks for visiting these links. If you'd like to share them or if you just want to bookmark them for later, uh, they're in your inbox now. It's totally something you could do. Um, searching. Searching is so, so important. Uh, this is because they're explicitly telling you what it is that they want to be doing on your website. How many people have a customized search uh, page? How many people have a customized search for a for page? No. This is a really great uh, way that you can take advantage of someone's intent on their website. So in this case, uh, I typed in the word gluten and nothing showed up. Um, also, by the way, I swear to God, I'm not going to do this the whole time. But if you want to check out really advanced searching, uh, Jetpack has Elasticsearch now. It gives you more relevant responses and faster responses. Um, but doing search, uh, like I said, you can see what uh, the intent of the user was, what you're missing, and, are, and you can create a reason to reach out. So now I can convert that search page into something like, thanks for searching my site. I haven't finished any posts on Bluebin yet, but I can email you the moment it's done. So this is giving someone an opportunity. Now, it like, may not always work, but if I've visited enough of Joy's posts on her website that I now trust her, uh, I might want to see what she has to say about gluten when it finally comes time. So now, not only can Joy look at her Google Analytics or her Jetpack stats and see what people are searching on your site, uh, but and, and that gives you intent and maybe even helps you create the content that you're missing on your website, but now you can start to prioritize that based off subscriptions that people are making based off these searches. So if you get 10 people searching for gluten and two of them subscribe for that gluten post, that's a really good opportunity for you to prioritize that next post and write that sooner than later. And this is something that applies to bloggers or if you have clients that are bloggers, this is something that you can be encouraging them to do. And if you are a designer or an agency, there's no reason you couldn't be charging for this service to your blogging uh, customers or your clients. So you could be sending them reports and saying to them, I think you should be writing about this, I think you should be writing about that. And that's an advantage that you, know, you would have over your competitors too. All right, so we covered blogs. For whatever reason, I, this is my first time ever doing a Google Slides uh, presentation. They didn't have a checkbox or a check mark. So I thought Pac-Man eating lightning bolts would be better to mark it as done. Uh, don't ask me why. Uh, so next is restaurant. So what are the goals of a restaurant? Goals of a restaurant website are very different from a blog website. A blog website, you typically want engagement. You want people on the site longer. You want them to go from page to page. Uh, for a restaurant website, and I pick on restaurant websites all the time, they're easy. Uh, the most important thing is to bring in customers. You want them to visit the location. Uh, you want them to make phone calls or get directions to your location or make a reservation. The idea uh, that time on a site or a restaurant website is extremely relevant, I think, is, is wrong. Uh, in my opinion, if you built a really great restaurant website, the likelihood of that person sticking around for very long is low. Uh, because what they come to your restaurant website for is hours, directions, uh, make a reservation, see what's on the menu, if you have any specials. I want to get in and out. And especially in this day and age when uh, there's so many options and the internet has given me the ability to connect with restaurants across the world, uh, I want to find what I'm looking for and get out as fast as possible. And frankly, uh, you know, having 20 pages and 50 blog posts and all that stuff might be good to get traffic in, but it doesn't necessarily make sense to try and force those people to stay on your site. Uh, so you have completely different goals when you're running a restaurant website. Uh, so this is a restaurant in Boston uh, that my wife and I love, uh, Paparazzi. It's an Italian restaurant. Um, I'm very happy with uh, the way that they built their site. It's very simple, it's very easy, it's mobile. Uh, and when I clicked on locations, they gave me lots of phone numbers multiple times. They gave me lots of addresses, lots of maps, lots of hours. Uh, at the very end of the day, all I care about is the fact that this looks like it's up to date, it looks like it's accurate, and I can get in and out. But let's take uh, an example of what uh, things we can learn from a user just by location and their intent for a restaurant website. Let's say we have one user who's 500 miles away and they're looking at the restaurant website while the hours of the restaurant are closed. 
Um, and then we have another user who is looking at the restaurant website. They're within 10 minutes of the restaurant, and it's while the restaurant is open. Can you guys see immediately what's happening here? The first person, the person on the top right, maybe they're visiting the website because they're looking for a, a restaurant that's close to them and they found the wrong one. Good for you. You show up in the search results. Um, that's great. There's nothing you really need to do about that. But maybe it's because they're visiting Boston. Maybe they're planning on going to Boston soon. Maybe they live in Boston and they've traveled outside of town. Someone called and said, hey, let's make a reservation at this restaurant. Or you know, maybe they're traveling here for a vacation. Uh, at that point, setting them a coupon or something like that right at that moment or a discount is probably less relevant. What's really relevant is to show them that they can make a reservation and keep reminding them of that. The other person is obviously uh, has a much more stronger uh, level of intent to arrive at that restaurant today. Uh, so they're probably looking for a place to eat. They're probably looking for a place to eat within the next hour or so. And this is a great opportunity to show them a proximity coupon. And I love proximity coupons because what it does is it encourages people to make that decision to come in when they otherwise might not. So you might travel through the internet and find two or three restaurant websites before you decide where you want to go. But the one that shows me a proximity coupon, the one that shows me 20% off if I come in in the next hour, or if I make a reservation or something like that, um, is highly relevant to me and my intent at that moment. Uh, and if you know anything about this user, if you saw them visit different things on their site. So for example, if you do have menu items and they did check out um, some, I don't know, uh, cool drink like a watermelon sangria, which they actually have, um, you can offer that to them. Uh, you know, take what is relevant to them at that moment, what you've learned about them in the last few moments that they're searching your site, and apply it. If they look at a menu item for a decent amount of time, offer it to them for free, or offer it to them for 50% off if they get there within the next two hours. It's a really great way to push them to make that decision to come in. All right, so more pack men, more women. I don't know. Uh, next is e-commerce. What are the goals of an e-commerce site? We're going to keep it simple for today. Uh, we want to make the sale or get the email uh, as a last resort. Um, so, most important thing when you're searching a website, uh, an e-commerce site, is search. Uh, you know, a lot of search happens outside of the site. It's happening on Google. Uh, that's where most of my searching happens. Uh, unless I have a really trusted brand like Amazon, and then I'll go and search their site. Uh, one of the things that I love about uh, the times that you visit something is that you can start to become extremely uh, passionate about converting people. Uh, so here's our um, automatic hiring page, or we're actually hiring for someone who has a remote controller. I think that I'm having some fun with that. Um, but on the right there, you see that blue box? That happens, uh, that pops up if you visit that page a few times. It's a nice little prompt to encourage people to, to uh, apply if they've been to this page enough times. So if you look at a standard e-commerce page, um, if I visited this bag on more than one occasion, but I haven't actually done it and added it to the cart and purchased it, uh, this is a great opportunity to track that user, understand their intent, they're obviously interested in this product, but they haven't pulled the trigger yet, uh, maybe all you need to do is give them 10% off. Uh, and if you add a sense of urgency, usually with a ticker or a time uh, sensitive element or something like that, uh, you can get them to increase the likelihood that they would add it to the cart. Um, the next thing uh, is, let's say that they go through the whole sales process and they check out, that's great. But let's say they get to the cart and then they abandon it. The cart abandonment is probably one of the most important things that uh, e-commerce shops are researching and improving on uh, all the time. Uh, if you have their email address, uh, you can send them a coupon, which happens all the time. How many people, you, you all get coupons, right, in, the, in your email? Uh, so here's a little nugget uh, that nobody really does. Uh, I haven't seen it happen yet, and I'm not sure why, because I think it's a, a really advantageous thing that you can do. In that email is a cookie. Everybody who's ever used MailChimp or anything like that, you can track open rates on the email. But if you tie that open rate to a coupon's date of expiry, 
inspiration. Um, you can see that they're, they opened a coupon maybe a week or two after the sale ended. And so that person had intent. They went into their inbox, they searched out the email, they opened it again, and now that coupon's completely useless. You can tie that experience to a new email and just fire off another email and tell them, hey, here's another 100 bucks off. So if I'm going through this process and I see that I have, I remember that this company sent me a coupon, and let's pretend that today is the 23rd, um, that old email opening can ping your server with that open rate, that, that pixel, and it can fire off a new one. And so now I can write something like, we're bummed that you missed the $100 off sale. You're in luck. You found an extra $100 lying around and it's all yours in the next 20 minutes. Uh, so I would hope that you have better content writers than me. Uh, <laughs> But uh, I think it's a great opportunity for us to reach out to those customers that we otherwise would have lost. And there's a very large segment of customers who will only buy something when it's on sale. So if they're going through the process of looking for a coupon and finding that old archive email, uh, don't lose out uh, because the coupon's expired and think that that's the end of the journey. Uh, and you have to wait for them to show back up at your website. Uh, you can be highly relevant and uh, be um, in real time make a decision to email them and reach back out again. All right, tax. And we have seven minutes, so I have to make this quick. Uh, we'll do the same goals for a SaaS company. So SaaS, I wanted to point out is that you're basically selling a service rather than a product. It's no shipping, you're not trying to get them to, to buy something once. It's usually buying a recurring subscription to a product or service. Um, years ago, I used to work for a company that did uh, insurance websites. And one of the few things that we made as decisions early on is that when these locations, when these businesses had 50 or 100 locations, uh, the fastest way that we can make things relevant for you were to sort those locations by closest to you where you were at that moment. Especially for insurance agencies when uh, you need to get to your local office and you need to make a phone call or something like that. So that was just a quick little trick that we did back then. But the, the thing about insurance agencies is that they often have web pages that look like this, which aren't bad. And I want to make the point that this is a great way to segment your site. If you offer uh, multiple products, you should definitely build pages like this to talk about each one individually. And it's not just about informing the customer, because you could do that on a single landing page. It's about understanding their intent and what is valuable to them. So if in this case, I had a single landing page and it explained the benefits of auto, home, life, umbrella, flood, renter's insurance, all that on one page, I might pro provide just as good of an example to those customers or experience to those customers, but I'm not learning as much. But when customers are clicking motorcycle, ATV, or whatever, then I'm beginning to understand what it is that's important to them. So building pages like this out are great. Um, but here's the thing that we did. Uh, we built it, a system so that you would get an email address early on in the user's journey. So you ask them one thing. What is it that brought you in to, to, for insurance today? Nine times out of ten, it was either renters or homeowners insurance. And that was a very quick way for us to get their email. The thing was is that once we collected their email, their journey didn't end on the website. They often start to browse other things. And the more information we gathered, the more relevant of an experience we could build for them. If we knew that they weren't in California, we might not offer them earthquake insurance. But if they lived in Chicago, where there's a ton of boats on, on the lakes out there, uh, we might offer them marine insurance. But then what we started doing is tracking what they were doing after they submitted that form and tying that to our CRM. So, for example, if you fill out a form saying, I'm interested in homeowners insurance, and we ask you, are you interested in anything else? And you say, no, fine. But then you go on to look at ATV insurance, or boat insurance, or something like that. Um, what we did was we tied that traffic to the CRM so that the insurance company, uh, the insurance agent, when they would call that person, they had notes on what that person was specifically doing on that website after they submitted that form. So then they can start into conversations about like, hey, are you thinking about buying a boat? Are you thinking about buying an RV? Those types of things help them understand the value that you, pro you provide to those customers beyond just simply home or insurance like that. 
Um, all right, moving a little bit quicker. Onboarding is the next most important thing. And uh, one of the tools that we built at Automatic is Jetpack Onboarding. And as you can see here, the opening page, uh, we wanted to provide value to customers, but we also wanted to profile them. The reason we want to profile them is because the more we understand about what you're trying to build, what kind of website you're trying to build, the better tools we can provide you. So our opening question is, what kind of site can we help you set up today? Business or personal? And what this leads into is a variety of other questions, and based off the answers that you give, it takes you down a different path. So for example, if you decide, said that you're building a business website, uh, we might ask you, uh, do you need uh, a map on it? And then you type in your address, and then the map would automatically show up. Or we might automatically give you a contact us page with a contact form. Or we might offer you WooCommerce, because you're already selling online. Uh, every single question inside of this onboarding tool, and I was going to demo it, but we're out of time, is built in a way to provide value to the customer or the user while giving us information. So this is where I, in the description of today's talk, I talked about fair trade data. The idea that I'm collecting information from you, uh, it's extremely important and it provides a much better experience to the customer if you're asking for that information through providing value to those customers. So just keep that in mind in the future. I don't want you guys backing yourself in the corner. Sometimes uh, things can go awry. This is uh, my current Amazon uh, recommendation list. I wanted a ceiling fan for the one bathroom in my house, and Amazon won't stop trying to sell me ceiling fans. I don't know why they think I need 40, but for whatever reason, they haven't tied that product to a single purchase every few years. Uh, that's definitely important. It's not like a restaurant website where you want them to come in weekly. This is a product that you would want to move off that real estate. You don't want it on that real estate taking up that space because you could be showing me completely you know, other relevant things. And the worst thing is that I bought my ceiling fan from Amazon, so they should know that I made that purchase. The other thing is, and I blocked it out, is that there's something going on. I'm not even going to show it because I, I'm, it's not quite inappropriate, but it's definitely not something I want to work in. But I've never searched for women's apparel on Amazon ever. And this was making a recommendation of like ladies undergarments. And I have no idea why. And I joked around with Amazon on Twitter about it. Uh, but they completely missed the mark on that, on that one. So just keep in mind that you don't want to try to over-personalize things to the point where you're making mistakes. Um, and the other thing is don't try to be smarter than the user. Uh, so this is uh, the MBTA website today and looking for trains home. I know there are more trains than this, but it's only showing me the next three trains because it thinks that's all that I care about. That I'm making a decision because I'm on a mobile device, I must need a ticket immediately, and so it's only going to show me three. Whereas if I'm on a desktop, it might show me more because I have more real estate. That's a big time mistake. Don't do that because I'm actually looking for a train around 4 or 5 o'clock and they didn't show it to me. That's it. Sorry for the speediness of this talk. Thank you so much. Fantastic. Is this all done with Jetpack? 90% of what I talked about today is done with Jetpack, yeah. Yep. Yeah, they're just basic tools that you can use from pretty much any WordPress plugin. The real trick to this is the insights and understanding these things, like setting cookies and understanding the users and, and their analytics and tools and things like that. Um, but if you go to Tom's talk, he'll talk about exactly how to set those things up. Um, sorry there's no time for questions, but I will be at the Jetpack table if anybody wants to ask.